Christ is the image of the unseen God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were all things made, in heaven and on earth. Through him and for him were all things made, before all he exists, holds all things in one. The church is his body, and he is its head. He is the beginning and firstborn from the dead. In all things he alone is supreme. God made all his fullness to dwell in him, to reconcile through him all creation to himself. Everything on earth and everything in heaven, all gathered into peace by his death on the cross. Good morning, friends, and welcome to St. Saviors Online. Today is the third Sunday of the season of Advent. It is December 12th in the year 2021, and it is the Sunday also known as Gaudete Sunday, the Day of Rejoicing. It is good to be gathered with you together today here on YouTube. I hope that you're all well and healthy. As we gather together today, we want to acknowledge, as always, that our community gathers on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Seelk people of the Okanagan Nation. And so we recommit ourselves to the work of reconciliation. It's a work that begins in ourselves, in our own persons, in our own bodies, and it extends outwards as we go into the rest of the world around us, into our life as a community, into our life as a broader society. And so as we enter into this time of prayer and worship and praise today, let us enter in in a moment of silence. Let us pray. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestors. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, teachers, what should we do? And he said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations and be satisfied with their wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered them all by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. Hmm. But the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors, 
and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. I come to you in the name of God, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. Over the past 60 some odd years, let's say, the shape of the social conscience of the Western world and uh, increasingly the global world as well has started to shift. It started to change around a little bit. Ethics have always been an important consideration. The, the, the full scope of human history, as long as we've been writing things down, we've been writing about ethics. Um, but there's been this sort of dramatic awakening, I would say, throughout the 20th and 21st centuries to the roles that power and positioning play in any given encounter between peoples. And there's a different sort of form or shape to the ethical reflections that we have, I think, or have had for quite a while now. Um, from post-structuralist philosophers like Jacques Derrida or Michel Foucault, to popular social movements like Occupy Wall Street, maybe almost a decade ago now, if you remember that one or Black Lives Matter, or Every Child Matters, all of these big movements, social movements of the 21st century, there is a growing awareness of the importance, not just of these objective markers of power and wealth, but of the relative differential in power and wealth between different people, how that's affected. So for instance, an older marker of success in um, money management would be to identify someone by a certain threshold of wealth or income. When I was growing up, you know, back in the early or late 80s, you had truly made it if you were a millionaire. Right? That, was, that was still the rhetoric. Millionaires were the cream of the crop of society in the eyes of, you know, little six-year-old primary school students. Today, with inflation and as the Wealth of the ultra-rich has grown so exceedingly large, so absurdly quickly, it doesn't even make sense to anymore to sort of separate people out as millionaires. I mean, really, it's a it's million dollars is, is worth very little. I mean, it's worth a, a home, a standalone home in the Okanagan these days. Investment banks have predicted that Elon Musk, the, currently the richest man in the world, could realistically become the world's first trillionaire. So in the span of my own lifetime, we've gone from identifying millionaires to identifying trillionaires. At levels like that, numbers basically become meaningless. They are uh, no longer uh, important or helpful identifiers. So what many people have turned to these days in evaluating the, the social, the economic clout of someone like that, like Elon Musk, is to look at the relative wealth in comparison to that of others. A couple of years ago, I remember uh, a bunch of different blogs and YouTube videos trying to help people understand the scale of Jeff Bezos' wealth, who at the time was the richest person in the world, with a total wealth of about $204 billion. To scale, Jeff Bezos himself, as an individual, had a net worth greater than the poorest 270 million people in the world. If you had a job that paid you $50,000 a year, perhaps a sort of an average job these days, in order to save up that same amount, you would need to save your entire salary, never spending a nickel of it, for over 4.1 million years. Think about that. 
The point of all of this is that the objective markers of status and wealth seem to be becoming less and less important and less and less interesting, and in many ways less and less relevant all the time. And what's becoming more and more significant and important and relevant and interesting is the subjective markers of status and power and wealth, which is something that the anti-oppression movement has started to label privilege. Privilege is often um, thought of or defined as the a, a right that someone owns or a, a, you know, a privilege that someone owns. It's a, a comfort that they own. Or it's an exemption from responsibility or an exemption from duty that they own that they hold as a special benefit or advantage. Now, a lot of the language around privilege, I think, gets really out of hand really quickly. It can get quite exaggerated quite quickly. And if we're not careful about understanding what privilege is, then we can, I think, quite easily draw some really problematic conclusions from it. Privilege comes in different forms. Sometimes it's an earned privilege. So the authority of a professional identity is oftentimes, usually, an earned privilege. Having a literal pulpit to preach from is a form of earned privilege. There is training for this. There is, there is ordination, licensing. There is ongoing uh, work that's involved in having this, this like, literal pulpit. Um, same thing for other professions. There are many other types of unearned privilege, though, too. So these are qualities that benefit the person who carries the privilege, but through no action or work of their own, just because of who they are or where they were born. Race is an example of an unearned privilege. Right? So being white gives a person a weight, an audience in the public sphere that certainly black-skinned or brown-skinned people don't naturally get to take advantage of. Now, of course, all people are multivalent, right? Everybody comes with this, this bag full of identities, different identities, different, different um, ways, markers of, of identifying themselves. And so to say that a person enjoys one particular privilege like white skin, for instance, is not to say that their life is easy in every respect. And to say that a person lacks a particular privilege is not to say that their life is intrinsically or inherently difficult in all respects. What it does say is that in those particular instances, in that particular arena, in that particular lane, the two people are not starting on even ground. One person has a smooth track ahead of them, and the other might have a minefield. If we want to behave responsibly and ethically in society in the 21st century, one of the things that we need to be able to do before everything else is to recognize where we stand, to recognize what our positioning is, where we start, what particular privileges we enjoy, so we need to, first of all, investigate our identities, who we are in any given situation. That's the first thing. Secondly, we have to investigate how we use those privileges, how we behave with them. The privilege can be ignored, which, let's be honest, is never helpful. The privilege can be weaponized against other people, which is often what ends up happening if you ignore privilege. Or privilege can be used to benefit other people. With the way that society's moved in the past century, the past hundred years, in the discourse around privilege these days, there's a whole lot of shame and guilt and stigma often attached to holding a privilege. And I, I don't go in for that. I don't think it's helpful. In race theory, you hear a lot about white guilt about the crippling shame that can be experienced when white people encounter the ways that the historically white colonialist movement has impacted black and brown bodies. There can be an extreme sense of shame and belonging to a particular heritage and skin tone, which I think is really just quite counterproductive in the end, especially when it comes to unearned privileges. These are, these are usually things that we have absolutely no control over. And so the experience of shame 
actually is just debilitating. It can never actually lead to anything good or healthy or positive. It can only draw us downwards into a world where everyone suffers together and no one is ultimately liberated. What is important, though, is the third task, doing something with our privilege. So the first task was understanding our position, understanding our privilege, recognizing it. The second task is investigating how we've historically used or experienced that privilege or that lack of privilege. And the third task is making the conscious decision to act with it, to act upon it. And it's precisely that choice that says something integral about a person's character. What are the choices that you make when you recognize the privileges that you hold? What are you supposed to do with privileges that you enjoy? Do you use them to amass more power, more authority, more privileges of different sorts for yourself? Are you collecting privileges? Or do you put them to work for the betterment of the world around you, for the sake of your neighbor? It's that exact sort of question that John's dealing with in today's Gospel account when the people come out to find him in the desert. In some of the harshest language we hear in the Gospel, John greets them with that, that great invective, you brood of vipers. Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he goes on, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. It seems that the issue John was facing was dealing with a people who had absorbed their privileged position as people of the covenant, as descendants of Abraham, as people who were within the in-group. And they'd chosen it to use it as a way of ignoring all the other responsibilities they had to their neighbors. So the wealthy were amassing coats for themselves rather than sharing with those who had none. The uh, the, the authorities, the people who had the sort of political authority, were collecting more tax revenue than they were supposed to in order that they themselves could take a cut of it. And the powerful were extorting money from others by virtue of the sword. And so those who wielded um, the authority of, of power, of physical force, were taking advantage of that. The people coming to John the Baptist were those who were either blind to their privilege or those who had specifically chosen to recognize it, to take it, and to abuse it. The thing is, it made no difference to John. We are all just as culpable as one another, as the next person down the line, when it comes to the abuse of our power or the ignorance of our power and privilege before the judgment seat of Christ. But John has a way out for them. Not all is lost. The way out for them is to subvert that privilege, to take the privileges they enjoyed and to use it for the good of somebody else. It requires humility. It requires contentment with your positioning. Power and wealth can be incredibly addictive drugs. They can suck you in such that just a, a taste of them leaves you craving more, needing more. John says, just be happy with the privileges that you already have. John is speaking here to a people in the centers of power. His audience is the comfortable. It's a community, maybe not drastically unlike our own. I think it's important to recognize here that John is not talking in this case to those who are beaten down, to those who have been enslaved. A lot of the times throughout history, um, Christian rhetoric, uh, ethical reflections from, from political philosophers, everyone has told the people who were being abused, the people who were marginalized, to simply be happy with their lot in life. Christianity itself as a privilege, has been weaponized that way in the past. That's not what John is doing here today. John is talking to the people who themselves are comfortable and secure in their own places of power and privilege. In Advent, we anticipate the return of Christ. Not just through the story of Christmas, though. Not 
No, Jesus laid in a manger in the dead of night with angels singing around him. We anticipate the return of Christ in the fullness of the kingdom of heaven, a kingdom that is founded on mercy and love, but also a kingdom that privileges the poor and the dispossessed, that champions the outward expression of mercy and grace and has no tolerance for works that rob others of that grace by hoarding the blessings of God for ourselves. Just as the kingdom of God is already all around us, we simply have to, to recognize it, to, to look for it, to open our eyes to it, so too the judgment of Christ is already all around us, working in our world in subtle and unseen ways. The good news in all of this is that none of it is written in stone. We all have the ability to become the people that God longs for us to be, to choose the way of the kingdom. And it's not even that complicated. It simply involves making a choice in each one of those small, tiny moments in life when we recognize our privilege in a given situation to choose love for the world around us. Thanks be to God. Oh, 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 oh,
peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for all those who are alone, for this community, our country, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. Remember especially the poor and the oppressed of our own community here in Penticton. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the Gospel, and all who seek the truth. For Lynn, our Bishop. Mark, the National Indigenous Archbishop. Linda, the Primate. And for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in the Church, both lay and ordained. For our own needs and those of others. We pray especially for Eileen, Allison, Alice, Andrea, Art, B, Brent, Bruce M, Callie, Chris, Craig, Cyril, Dan, Darren and Henri, Dave and Bev, Derek, Doug, Dylan, Effie, Emily, Frank S, Frieda and Grant, Gabe, Gavin, Jean F, Jake, Janessa, Janet, Lou, Luke and Yalan family, Margareta, Marilyn Gilbert, Nathan and Chloe, Pat, Peter, Peter B, Simone, Spencer and Diana, Terry Mick, and Terry and Warwick. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, and we remember them before you now. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died in the peace of Christ, and for those whose faith is known to you alone, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom, and we remember them before you now. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins, and we remember them before you now. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask, and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God of power and mercy, you call us once again to celebrate the coming of your Son. Remove those things which hinder love of you, that when he comes he may find us waiting in awe and wonder. For him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, once again, friends, good morning and welcome to this Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent. Today, our call to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's final report is call to action number 24. It reads, We call upon medical and nursing schools in Canada to require all students to take a course dealing with Aboriginal health issues, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, and Indigenous teachings and practices. This will require skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism. That's the 24th call to action of the TRC final report. We have some announcements today. Um, first off, a very special thank you to everybody who helped out yesterday with the Christmas fair, the December fair um, market whatever we're calling it this time, it was a great success. Um, thank you to everybody who came out to help support that, and thank you to Joan Dalby and her team for uh, especially setting up all of the, uh, the, the the tables and everything and getting all of the casseroles ready. Thank you to Mary Mays for making the Tulsiai, uh, a Christmas classic where I'm from. Um, if you weren't able to pick up any of your pre-orders, they should be available at the church today um, at the service this morning, and it would have been or um, in the coming week, let us know. Uh, coming up this week, a number of things happening as well. We have our Advent study. That is happening this uh, Wednesday at 3 p.m. as always. Um, that is going to be on Zoom. So it's a short video followed by about 45 minutes of discussion and reflection. Then on Friday, we have Centering Prayer. That's at 9.30, as always, and then again, that's on Zoom. Today, at 4 p.m., here on YouTube again, we have our annual Lessons and Carol service. And so everybody's invited out to that. Um, it will be available online at any point, like always, but for those who are participating at 4 p.m. today, uh, at the conclusion of that service, we will be having a little cheers, happy hour, uh, coffee time get together on zoom. So please come on out to that. It would be great to see everybody I know we haven't had a whole lot of opportunities to uh, to meet up together, especially on zoom lately So it'd be great to see you all uh, The links for all of that can be found in parish life our newsletter Coming up next Sunday at 4 p.m. Again, we have our jazz vespers service. That's the December Christmas one um, It will be a great time we are requiring registrations for that, pre-registration for that. That is in-person happening at the church at St. Saviour's. Um, there is a capsule of 50 people. So if you'd like to attend that one, please get your registrations in as soon as possible. Uh, same thing for our Christmas Eve services, which are happening on Friday the 24th. Um, there are two services currently scheduled, one at 4 p.m. and one at 7 p.m. Uh, again, we need people to register ahead of time for those. They are filling up. They're filling up quickly, so if you'd like to attend, please register now. Um, if we need to add in a third service, we will do that. It will be later on in the evening, probably a 9 o'clock service. But at this point, we only have the two services, 4 o'clock and 7 o'clock, and we're asking everyone to please pre-register. Okay, I think those are all the announcements that I've got right now. Uh, Church Council is meeting this coming Wednesday. We meet uh, again on Zoom. I hope that you all have a great week. I know that it's a busy time of the year, and I know that um, in the lead up to Christmas especially, uh, even in strange times, even though this is our second Christmas going through it in a pandemic, um, it can still be a very busy, busy occasion and season. So I hope that you are all able to find some time to rest and uh, enjoy this season. My friends, the Lord bless you and preserve you from all evil. Keep you in eternal life. In the name of God, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.